Hello. Um, so yeah, confusing me, this is another map that's going to give a presentation at the end of the day. Um, so I'm going to talk to you about some joint work with my supervisor in Mostorki. Um, and what we're going to be chatting about is a, uh, an extension to Hamiltonian Monte Carlo, where the idea is we're able to cope with a certain amount of multimodality in the distribution, uh, and also get uh, estimations of the normalizing constant of the density we're uh, computing samples from. So, okay, so you can kind of put that on a bit of a thermal shutting. Uh, so the idea we have is we have some uh, density over some potentially high dimensional real value state space, um, and this density has potentially got a number of different uh, regions of high density that are separated by the distribution, so it's a typical high level distribution. Um, and more specifically, we're going to consider uh, that we have this target density defined by this uh, potential function phi, and this indeed dimensional state space. What we want to do is a classical inference setting, we want to be able to compute expectations with respect to this density, uh, but also potentially compute normalizing constants. Uh, so this might be interesting as a phase inference setting or computing like a model evidence test. Okay, so the specific uh, kind of class of approximate inference methods that I'm considering are MCMC methods, and more particularly Hamiltonian or hybrid multi color. Uh, so this is a method introduced from the uh, statistical physics literature in the, in the 80s by some German colleagues. Um, and the key idea here is that we're going to take our original state space x um, and augment it with a further momentum variable of the same dimension as x. And then effectively what we're going to do is run a, a classical dynamical um, Newtonian dynamics within this system to uh, come up with long-range proposals which have a good chance of acceptance. And so just to again introduce a bit more notation, um, we attach some Gaussian uh, marginal density to our momentum variables with some mass matrix as the covariance. We call this overall uh, logarithm or negative logarithm of the uh, joint target, the Hamiltonian. And then a dynamic we run is just an instance of Newton's second law, it's just uh, it's F equals MA. And we basically simulate that dynamic, that uh, continuous time dynamic in discrete time using a particular class of integrators. Um, and then we look at the change in energy across that trajectory. And the nice thing about this dynamic is that it's fundamentally energy conserving. Uh, the approximation of it is not quite, but we can correct for the bias introduced by that by including this metropolis hastings step. But because of the approximate energy conservation, we're very likely to accept, providing we appropriately choose the integrator. So that might have all sounded a little bit complex, but the nice thing is that we have lots of uh, quite general uh, implementations of HM2 that we can use in practice. So free max like Stan that we've had a lot about, and also things like KMC3 we're able to automatically compute the gradients that we need to do this inference, um, and also further the, these tweak parameters in uh, Hamiltonian Monte Carlo, the, the step size and the number of integrated steps we're going to take. But there have been developed nice uh, methods. There's this uh, no U-turn sample that was developed by Hoffman, who was talking earlier, and Andrew Gelman, uh, which is able to come up with sort of adaptive methods for tuning those parameters. Um, a key kind of drawback of HMC and the economy of lots of MCMC method, so is that it doesn't necessarily deal that well with multimodal distributions. So to kind of tie that down a little bit more, um, what we're doing in HMC is we're, we're taking our original, say, some multimodal, uh, bimodal Gaussian density, and then augmenting it with some Gaussian, and end up with this joint density. And then we're exploring this joint density with this Hamiltonian dynamic. If there is a large uh, potential gap between these two different modes, then the HMC dynamic will tend to just remain confined to one of these modes for long periods. And as we, as we had earlier, this is act, actually this kind of exponential scaling in the height of this potential gap uh, and how long it's going to take to traverse across that. Um, so we tend to get these you know, biased empirical histograms which don't approximate the true function that we're interested in. Um, so a kind of common method for dealing with these multimodal distributions is to introduce some concept of system temperature. Um, and you define a kind of ensemble of, on different distributions at different temperatures. So we introduce some inverse temperature parameter beta, um, and then so also some uh, simple normalized base density that are parameterized by the psi potential, and then we geometrically bridge between the two of these. Um, we now have this kind of inverse temperature dependent uh, normalizing constant or partition function, um, and this is going to come key to the kind of descriptions of the, the difficulties of these methods later. So, um, in kind of typical implementations of this, in things like simulator tempering and parallel tempering, we choose some discrete set of betas which cover um, our beta space, and then we run some augmented uh, Markov chain in the system. 
Um, the problem with these methods, or at least one of the, the drawbacks, is that the performance of them is usually quite sensitive to the choice of uh, how we cover the speed of space. Um, and depending on how we partition that space, we can get uh, good or bad performance, and it's, it's quite a hard tuning problem to choose how we're going to uh, define that temperature schedule. So a kind of natural idea, and one that has uh, been looked at various times, is to introduce instead a continuous temperature parameter formulation. So the idea is here, we have some continuous beta parameter, and our density would naturally bridge between the base density and the target density as we vary that parameter. Um, so a particularly interesting um, kind of instantiation of this, which was uh, recently introduced in statistical physics literature, was this extended uh, Hamiltonian approach to continuous tempering um, by Gobble and Lampula. And so here, um, they basically introduced this temperature control variable, which indirectly temp uh, defines what the inverse temperature is going to be. Um, so we have this kind of smooth piecewise defined function, uh, which relates to our U variable to this inverse temperature. And then we define some extended Hamiltonian via this U variable. So we, we have this uh, typical beta times our uh, phi potential. We introduce the Gaussian prior on our U's. We have a momentum associated with our original state, and then another conjugate momentum associated with our U variable. So the key thing about the definition of this uh, temperature control uh, function is that the uh, beta value is exactly equal to 1 for some uh, finite range of the, uh, the U variable. And so what this corresponds to is that in this joint space between our x's and u's, uh, there's going to be a sort of zero measure set in which these beta are exact, uh, a non-zero measure set in which these beta are exactly equal to one. And if we condition on our u's being in that range, the uh, density that the MCMC dynamic will converge to on our x's will be proportional to the target of interest. So we can use this to compute expectations with respect to our target density. Um, so in this original paper, this was all done within a molecular dynamics framework, and it was uh, used within a metal hopeless adjusted Langevin algorithm to uh, compute free energies of um, molecular configurations. So a um, kind of drawback of the formulation in this uh, particular uh, setting is that we, we now know that this um, the marginal density on this introduced U variable is going to have a term depending on this Gaussian prior, but then more importantly, um, this kind of log partition function, uh, so the, the partition function. Um, and the problem with this is that, um, particularly in this case here, where uh, because of this kind of statistical physics background, we're uh, assuming our base density here is flat, the uh, partition function, as we come to uh, a temperature close to zero, is going to become infinite, basically, we have a proper flat prior. And uh, so we end up with this uh, large change in the uh, marginal density on U across this space. And this kind of introduces this, um, these potential barriers in the U space and the kind of free energy of this that we now need to somehow be able to cross. And if we just naively run uh, hit, uh, some dynamic in this space, we tend to remain confined to certain regions of this U spectrum for long periods. So the method that, that the, was used in the original paper to deal with this was to introduce some further um, metadynamics, which basically adaptively, uh, add an adaptive history dependent bias to flatten out the spectrum, the histogram across uh, this U space. Um, so this is able to cope with quite general uh, sort of free energy dependencies, but the, the problem with this is that we, to be able to let, get um, valid MCMC samples at the end of the day, we either have to have some non-vanishing adaption, um, we need to know when to cut that off, or we need to do some uh, quite involved, important re-weighting re of the samples that we get. So, in our approach, we try to come up with slightly easier ways to try and flatten out this histogram um, by basically leveraging cheap deterministic approximations to the distribution of interest. So we introduce these two extra uh, parameters or uh, functions, um, and the first is this log zeta term, and we say that we're just going to set this to some deterministic approximation of our log uh, normalizing constant. Um, and then we also say we're going to choose this base density to be approximately matched in moments to our target density. And so there are various different ways we could, we could choose these uh, base densities. We could do something like if it's available to us, EP to come up with them. Um, in other cases, we can use variational approximations and class approximation. Um, and any approximation will be valid, but it turns out the kind of performance of the method uh, will be kind of dependent on the better the approximation generally, you get better performance. Um, so in the kind of example we just showed there, this kind of has an effect of like flattening out these uh, potential barriers and leading to a much better exploration of that U space. 
So the, the other nice thing about this kind of formulation is that it retains the kind of natural, separable, Hamiltonian structure of the original HMC. Um, so we, we kind of think of some extended state space on our X and U variables, and then some conjugate momentum uh, defined by our P and Ds, and we now just have some natural uh, kinetic energy defined in terms of that extended X, and then some natural net energy extended in terms of the uh, Ps. And so this means we are completely in the, the normal HMC framework. We can use a, the, the typical leap forward integrator with this. We don't need to do anything special. And it's up to some redefinition of our energy function or our uh, target density. We can use this within standard HMC implementation without any other changes in the underlying dynamic. So as a quick visualization of what this looks like, I'm going to try and justify what's going on. The idea is that in this original space was this potential barrier between the two modes and we weren't able to cross that with regularity. By now, by introducing these kind of lower and lower barrier pathways between the two different modes, this simulated trajectory is able to regularly kind of move between these two modes and we get this nice uh, separation between them. And so if we run that long enough with, um, with an HMT framework, we get these samples from this joint distribution. And I claimed at the start that we're also going to be able to get normalizing constant estimates. And we can kind of see intuitively why this, this might be the case. So we, we know, uh, just by construction, what the normalizing constant of this base density is. So this, for example, this might be a Gaussian. Um, and we also can estimate from these samples the relative time spent underneath this uh, target density and then this base density. And by using the known base density here and that ratio, we can come up with some uh, consistent estimator of our uh, normalizing constant. So very quickly, just to run through some experimental results, so looking at that um, 1D Gaussian mixture that we had at the start, um, if we run the chain in this case now, we get regular uh, moving between the two different modes, so the points in blue are those corresponding to U within this feet of 1, uh, so the target density, and we now get this nice uh, accurate estimate of our marginal density, and we also, uh, although it's not that interesting, get some uh, estimate of the base density. Um, so we can see here, this module on the U, that there is still some kind of uh, barrier here, but that uh, the U uh, trace shows that we are still able to move back and forth in this space quite well. So just to kind of find a final example, does this apply to more high dimensional spaces? Obviously, we're not necessarily interested in being able to sample from the 1D Gaussian mixture. Um, so to kind of consider that, I looked at this kind of class of structured Gaussian mixture models, which correspond to the continuous relaxation of the Boltzmann machine. And the nice thing about these distributions is that they both tend to have this quite high multimodality, so they're challenging to sample from, but because there is an associated uh, discrete distribution where we can exactly compute the moments of and relate that to the moments of the continuous distribution, we have a nice kind of ground truth to work from for our kind of convergence measures. Um, so we implemented this all in stand, so as I said, this is easy to do. We can just uh, redefine our energy function and then ran both um, the kind of static HMT implementation there and this no u tensor sample that I briefly talked about earlier. And we can see, so the, the non-extended original Hamiltonian formulation, we basically just end up confined to a single mode and get these very poor moment estimates, which are not converging at all to the true values. Um, and we also get these uh, nice estimates of the log normalizing constant, so this is just showing the error in the log normalizing constant. And we, this, this black line here represents the approximate uh, normalizing constant value that we used in the kind of this base density. And so this is just to kind of illustrate that we are getting some improvement across that deterministic approximation. So it's not just here that I'm basically showing that we're, we're just getting that deterministic approximation. Um, sometimes it doesn't work quite as well. This is definitely not a you know, panacea for all problems. Um, so here we're getting quite good convergence in our first moments, but the second moments kind of tend to this baseline, which corresponds to the, uh, the error in the second moments of the, the Gaussian base density that we get. Um, but here we still get some gain in the uh, approximation of the normalizing constant. Um, but yeah, it, it, this method definitely does have limitations on how well it will work in all distributions. Um, so just to conclude, um, so what we're proposing is a thermodynamic HMC augmentation, uh, which is able to deal with a certain amount of multimodality and also allow estimations of these normalizing constants. Um, given the definitions of this approximate normalizing constant and base density, um, it can be easily implemented within uh, existing HMC code. Um, the nice thing about it is it exploits these cheap deterministic approximations um, while still having the advantages of the sort of asymptotic guarantees that we get from MCMC methods. 
Um, and finally, um, all of this kind of came out of a, a paper from the statistical physics lecture journal, um, and originally obviously HMT in itself, contribution from uh, statistical physics. So it's, it's interesting to see that there continue to be these crossovers where uh, physicists are coming up with quite interesting methods that apply to statistical and machine learning methods. Okay, thank you. Uh, so yeah, I'd like to acknowledge my uh, supervisor, sorry, and also, so Ben uh, is one of the original authors on the uh, continuous tempering paper. It was actually he who pointed out uh, that the, the kind of uh, potential of this would have been an HNT method to us, so I'd like to thank his contribution as well. Uh, thanks, Matt. Um, I was actually curious uh, why you uh, used a temperature control, control variable instead of directly trying to model the inverse temperature. Okay, so that kind of comes down to the fact that if, if we directly use the beta parameter, then the target distribution then just corresponds to you know, one uh, particular value of that, which is kind of this infinitesimal beta. And so then if we were trying to choose just from uh, our sample, where beta was exactly equal to one, we, we would, in some continuous space, never exactly hit that. Uh, we could approximate around that, but we kind of lose these nice guarantees. So over there we have some control of that. How much of our time we spend with these are exactly the one. That's great. Um, are there any other questions? So you have to choose. You have to choose these uh, data one, and data two parameters, and those seem like they could have a large effect on how well you do. So how much effect? What did you want? Yeah. Uh, so they are important to a certain degree, definitely. Um, you in some ways balance how long we're going to spend underneath this base density and the target density. Um, and in all of the experiments I tried, I basically set um, the kind of gap between the two of them to be equal and found that worked quite well heuristically. Um, the important thing is less um, their particular values, but the gap you leave between them. And so that kind of controls how uh, quickly you're going to kind of, uh, change between these. Uh, yeah, that's kind of implicitly your annealing schedule. Yeah, exactly. Um, and so related to that, we also had this mass uh, variable on the momentum of the uh, U variable, so this is M V, and that kind of also controls how quickly we tend to move across that. And so the combination is kind of some over-parameterization here. The, the scale of that M variable and then the gap between those is quite important, and you do need to tune that to a certain extent so that, that you get reasonably slow movement across that density. Um, but I found in practice that uh, kind of setting those speech parameters just to not be identified, and then setting this m variable to around 100 will actually cost quite a range of different dimensionalities. Uh, so yeah, I, I'm sure in general it, it would be quite important to change parameter and it would be good to come up with adaptive methods, but you can choose reasonable values to some extent. Uh, I saw a question over here somewhere. Okay, maybe that question has been answered. So uh, thank our speaker again. Thanks. So now is the, the panel 